Exactly. So for this session, um, I'm going to kind of try and bring everything together as best as I can and try and help us really center ourselves in what struck us over the weekend um, so that it's not lost. So it's always useful when you're doing classes like this to, you know, kind of bring it down to its simplest form and ask yourself what resonated yeah, what resonated, what really struck me in a new level. Maybe it was something I already knew, but now I know it deeper. Repeat it to yourself, you know, write it down, repeat it to yourself. Don't lose the lesson. Then also what you want to be doing is to think very deeply about where you had doubt or questions and also don't lose those. You know, don't push away doubts, don't suffocate confusion, don't disassociate from the hard bits highlight them, you know, because often they're the gateway to a deeper form of wisdom. So if you can kind of think over the course of this weekend, what has deepened and struck me and opened up new layers of insight and understanding, also what doubts and questions have been opened up that I want to make sure I keep investigating and asking about. So just kind of having that <clears throat> in the back of your mind as, as thoughts to go home with, even though you're already home, um, thoughts to go on a walk with, yeah, after the course finishes. So what we're going to do now is um, set the motivation by doing a prayer called Calling the Guru from Afar. And Calling the Guru from Afar is powerful and inspirational and aspirational and helps connect us to the whole path, but it's also a very good learning tool for what is the guru? What is the guru Buddha? What is the guru Buddha that I'm merging with and becoming? So the prayer itself is a very deep teaching tool as well as just a good prayer to have in your tool belt. So we'll do that together. And if you feel comfortable saying it out loud with me, that can sometimes increase the focus. But if you'd rather just listen, that's totally fine too. So here we go, calling the guru from afar with a bodhicitta motivation. Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. The wisdom of all Buddhas, one taste with the Dharmakaya, is itself the ultimate nature of all kind Lamas. I beseech you, Lama, Dharmakaya, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. Wisdom's own illusory appearance, the conqueror with seven branches, is itself the ultimate basis of emanation of all kind lamas. I beseech you, Lama Sambhogakaya, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The play of various emanations suiting the dispositions of the many to be subdued is itself the behavior of the Sambhogakaya of the kind lamas. I beseech you, Lama Nirmanakaya, Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The play of the inseparable three kayas appearing in the form of the lama is itself one with the very essence of all kind lamas. I beseech you, lama, the inseparable three kayas. Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. All the infinite, peaceful, and wrathful yidams are also the Lama's nature. And since no yidam exists apart from the kind Lama, I beseech you, Lama, who comprises all yidams, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, in the bardo. The ordinary form of all Buddhas arises in the aspect of the Lama. Therefore, no Buddhas are observed apart from the kind Lama himself. I beseech you, Lama, who comprises all Buddhas, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The very form of all conquerors, wisdom, compassion, and power arises as the Lama. Therefore, the supreme Arya lords of the three types are also the kind Lama himself. I beseech you, Lama, who combines three families in one. Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The hundred, five, and three types, however many are elaborated, are the Lama. The pervasive master in whom they are all included is also the Lama. I beseech you, Lama, as master of all the types, 
Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The creator of all Buddhas, Dharma, and Sangha is the Lama. The one who combines all three refuges is the kind Lama. I beseech you, Lama, whose presence combines all refuges. Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. Thinking of how the actual form of all Buddhas arises in the aspect of the Lama and mercifully guides me, reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of how you show the excellent unmistaken path to me, an unfortunate wretched being abandoned by all the Buddhas reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of this excellent body, highly meaningful and difficult to obtain, and wishing to take its essence with unerring choice between gain and loss, happiness and suffering, reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of the experience of not knowing what to do when the great fear of death suddenly descends upon me reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of the experience of just now suddenly separating from all the perfections of this life and going on alone reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of how the suffering of hunger and thirst without a drop of water is directly experienced in the unfortunate Preta realm reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of how very repulsive and wretched it is to become a foolish, stupid animal and what it would be like to experience it myself reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of a refuge to protect me from this, since I'm now about to fall into the wretched states of bad migration, reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of how white and black actions are experienced and how to practice thorough and precise engagement and restraint reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of a method to escape this prison of endless existences, the source of all suffering, reminds me of you, Lama. Thinking of the plight of my pitiful old mother's pervasive as space, fallen amidst the fearful ocean of samsara and tormented there, reminds me of you, Lama. Therefore, Lama, please bless me to generate in my mental continuum effortless experience of the profound three principles of the path and the two stages. Please bless me to strive in one-pointed practice of the three trainings with the intense thought of renunciation in order to reach the secure state of liberation. Please bless me to train in the precious Supreme Bodhicitta with a special attitude taking responsibility to liberate all my graders by myself alone. Please bless me to follow after the ocean of conquerors with the will to cross to the very end of the great waves of deeds of the conqueror's sons. Please bless me to realize the supreme view, free of extremes, in which emptiness and dependent arising, appearance and emptiness, complement each other. Please bless me quickly to generate the experience of three, taking the three kayas into the path, ripening the bases of birth, death, and bardo. Please bless me to arise as the illusory divine body itself, the play of the four joys and four emptinesses, the wind and mind absorbed in the central channel. Please bless me to meet the ultimate Lama, the bare face of my innate mind, with the covering of perception of true existence and perceiving it as true removed. Please bless me to be one with your three secrets, Lama, in the vast Dharmakaya of great bliss, which has exhausted the elaborations of the two obscurations. In short, please abide inseparably in the center of my heart until the great enlightenment. And mercifully bless me of the child to follow after you, the father. Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. May I not arise heresy for even a second in the actions of the glorious guru. May I regard whatever actions are done as pure. With this devotion, may I receive the blessings of the Guru in my heart. Magnificent and precious Root Guru, please abide on the lotus seat at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and grant me the realizations of your holy body, speech, and mind. And so now let's just sit with that for three minutes, just letting it digest, sorting out what touches you sorting out what confuses you, just be with that prayer for a moment.
a spacious reflection. What is the guru? How is the guru? Where is the guru? Okay, so relax your attention. And then we're going to add to that just a reflection on the meaning of the Vajrasattva mantra. So this is in your retreat packet, but um, I'll just bring it up on the screen. Some of you will know this already, um, and some of you maybe haven't looked at it yet. So let's just unpack the Vajrasattva long mantra. So Om always means the qualities of the Buddha's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. All that is auspicious and of great value, that's what Om means generally and specifically in this context. Vajrasattva is the being who has the wisdom of inseparable wisdom and emptiness and is the Buddha of purification. Samaya is a pledge that must not be transgressed. Manopalaya lead me along the path you took to enlightenment. Vajrasattva teno bodhishta, make, my, make me abide closer to Vajrasattva's holy mind. Dito me bawa, please grant me a firm and stable realization of the ultimate nature of phenomena. Sutokaya me bawa, Please grant me the blessing of being extremely pleased with me. Supokaya me bawa. Bless me with the nature of well-developed great bliss. Anarakto me bawa. Bless me with the nature of the love that leads me to your state. Sawa siddhi me prayatsa. Please grant all powerful attainments. Sawa kama sutta me. Please grant all virtuous actions. 
Siddham Shriyam Kuru, please grant your glorious qualities. Whom the Vajra Holy Mind, Ha 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 Ho, the five transcendental wisdoms. Bhagawan, one who has destroyed every obscuration, attained all realizations, and passed beyond suffering. Sawa Tathagata, Vajra. All those who have realized emptiness, knowing things just as they are. Mame Mutsa, do not abandon me. Vajra Bhawa, the nature of indestructible inseparability. Mahasamaya Sattva, the great pledge being, the great being who has the pledge, the Vajra Holy Mind. Ah, the Vajra Holy Speech, whom the transcendental wisdom of great bliss, pay, clarifying the transcendental wisdom of inseparable bliss and emptiness and destroying the dualistic mind that obstructs it. So there's a lot to play with in terms of what is a blessing, what is a request, who are we talking to, what do we want? Right? There's a lot there. And always remember in Buddhism, when you're requesting, when you're beseeching, you're asking yourself as much as you're asking the divine. You're asking for a meeting of minds. You're opening to a meeting of minds. And that implies a fundamental confidence that you have Buddha nature, right? Your potential is for the mind to become fully developed. What it needs is that development. Your mind is obscured by karma and disturbing emotions, but they've never entered into the fundamental essence of the mind. They've always been additional, adventitious, extra, surface, which means they can be cleansed. And then what remains is this clear and knowing consciousness, which is the raw material for enlightenment, which then needs to be developed. So what you want is the meeting of minds with your mind as it is, with a mind that has been developed, and have that mind that is developed help wake up the potentialities, to water the seeds. And so a blessing coming from the outside is really implying that there was something there to be watered. You know, it could be all of the beautiful rain in the whole world onto the most beautiful fertile soil, but if there's no seed there, nothing can sprout. So you have the seeds already, and what you're asking for is rain. Yeah, but the rain is just a condition. You always have that potential there. And asking for the rain means the rain is felt, because actually it's raining all the time. Actually, it's raining all the time. So you're not asking for something that isn't already there. You're opening to the fact of it. So make sure you're always remembering that whatever prayers feel like a beseeching and a hoping and a, you know, pleading and a whatever, that you're really saying, may I open? May I open? May I open? May I connect? May I connect? May I connect? Yeah, that it's not passive. And it doesn't imply that you're the broken one and they're the fixed one. It's not that. You are not the low one. They are not the high one. No. We all have the equal consciousness. There is development that has occurred with some consciousnesses and lack of development that has happened with others. But when we're all Buddhas, we're all equal. Yeah. And why they became Buddhas first and we're still waiting, they had more conditions, tools, resources, supports. It was a dependent arising. It wasn't some sort of like innate magic of some people. You know, it's like when we read stories of figures in history that we really look up to and we think, what a remarkable person. Yes, they were a remarkable person, but they were remarkable dependently arisen. They had all of the causes and conditions and support and resources to bring out the best of a human. So too, we can become that. And maybe already are more than we give ourselves credit for. So enlightenment is never a passive experience. It's always a reaching back and an opening up. Yeah. So what we're going to do is just do a journal exercise about the guru, and then we're going to talk about it a little more. So... Having done uh, the course retreat, 
having seen Lama Zopa Rinpoche's advice to imagine all Buddhas and see all holy objects, statues, scriptures, texts, and tankas as one in essence with the guru, having read Calling the Guru from Afar just now, having looked at the meaning of the Vajrasattva mantra, describe your understanding of and connection with the Guru Buddha. So far, let that anchor in and then we'll go from there. So let's do that for um, 15, 20 minutes um, and um, I'll give you a little warning to, before we wrap it up. So go ahead and journal about that. And start to wrap up your thought. Any summaries or final impressions? Go ahead and finish those. So uh, the Buddha, the Guru, the Guru Buddha hyphen. <laughs> what are your impressions? Ideas or insights or confusions? Um, if someone says, so Tibetan Buddhists seem to be all about the Guru Buddha, what is that? <laughs> what would you say to them? Thank you, Venerable. This weekend has been amazing. Um, it's really, so the first sentence I wrote as a guru is a teacher, the one who awakens knowledge. And I'm not saying that, I'm not reciting that. I'm saying that mm -hmm. from my own experience. I mean, I truly feel that and believe that. Um, I am a retired teacher mm -hmm. and the education comes from a Latin word called educare, which means to draw forth. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I taught, I tried to hold that in my mind. I'm not filling up empty vessels. I'm helping draw forth what's already there. And I have to say, again, I'm, I'm like, I'm a Buddhist kindergartner. It's not like I'm some highly realized being. I'm really, truly am. Um, but my experience has been that these, the Buddhist languages, obscurations that come from my karma, from my negative karma, they feel like, and I was going to, it's ironic that you had us write about this because I was going to ask you about this this morning. Mm. When it, I've had some remarkable insights this week and what it feels like to me is like this hard scale has fallen away and all of a sudden it's like, oh, and it's not like, it's not like it's pouring into me. It's like mm. it was there and I just didn't realize it was there. And sometimes it feels more like I'm in a deep fog and I just can't see and then suddenly the fog kind of lifts and I can see. And I think that, I think to me, that's the Guru Buddha, um, mm. both inside myself and then also externally to me, helping guide me along the way. And I think about, I backpack a lot and I hike a lot. When I'm going to go hiking, the first thing I do is look at a map. I want to see the trail. And mm. I yeah. think about Atisha's lamp to light the path. Um, the, the Guru Buddhas, external Guru Buddhas are external to me, have walked this trail before. And it's so nice to have a trail map. And it's yeah. nice to have a guide who has done these things before. Um, and the thing that with this writing that really came out to me, the one piece I hadn't really grappled with before was the other piece of it is it's very comforting for me to have mm. Guru Buddhas. You know, you know, especially when I think of the last few years with COVID and stuff, it's like, what in the hell is happening to the world? Um, I'm not alone. You know, I don't want to do this alone. And to have these merit fields and these Buddha fields and they're nearby and they're, they're ready to help me. I just have to be willing to see that help coming. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, it's, so I think it's comforting and it's also helping to show me the way. Um, and yeah, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I don't know some nice wrap up, but that's kind of all the, the thoughts that float into my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's right on the money. You know, it's, it's like, um, you could walk the trail all by yourself, just cold, but you'd get lost and you'd trip and you'd hurt yourself and it would take way longer, but you could do it all by yourself. You totally could. It would just be less efficient and less fun. Yeah. And so might as well look at the map. And, you know, it's like looking at the map is kind of like looking at a Dharma text and then following the map is like integrating it. And once you've walked the trail yourself, you can really speak from experience to other people and say, you know, at mile four, there's going to be this weird steep spot, make sure you bring poles or whatever, you know, and 
that kind of knowing doesn't come just from reading the text, but you need the text. But you also need someone who's at least attempted it a few times or, you know, gone through it a bit and illuminated it. And as you say, comforting and warmth. It's almost like when you have a, a, a friend with you who's done the trail before, you relax into it in a different way. You still have to do walking. You can't like not be also walking, <laughs> but there's a great deal of relaxation if you're with someone who already knows where they're going. Yeah. So it, it's it's interesting to play with these concepts and ask like, who is giving what? What is responding to what? And of course, it's kind of so um, interconnected, it's hard to define. But it's more and more in experience, you start to learn what to tune into and what's going to give you that support. Yeah, other other thoughts from you folks? Um, you know, and doubts and questions, of course, too, you know, or um, just new ways of making connection. What is the Guru Buddha? How is the Guru Buddha? Where is the Guru Buddha? And like, how do you listen for the teacherness? You know, listen for the teacherness in every moment so that anything can teach you whether it intends to or not. You know, I think that's where we get hung up. It's like, I can listen for the teacherness when talking to my best friend, but I have a very strong impression that my best friend is an ordinary person and it's the ignorant leading the ignorant. And, you know, do I really want to um, look up to them in this way or whatever? But then if I adopt the attitude that the guru is there in the space they occupy, whether they're the Buddha or not actually is irrelevant. If I listen for the Buddha, I will hear personal advice, even in amongst all the, you know, personality quirks and styles of the person I'm listening to. You're going to hear the Buddha's getting to you through that once you're listening for it, you know, so that's interesting, but it means there has to be the wisdom in you that can recognize wisdom. Yeah, your wisdom able to recognize wisdom. And that's something I think that can give you so much confidence and faith in yourself is that in your deepest heart, you know, when something is wise, it has got the ring of truth, right? When something has the ring of truth and that's like your inner guru responding to the outer guru. Yeah. And having a, a physical human, what you've met <laughs> to be the catalyst for the inner conversation and then the kind of support for the ongoing conversation can't ever be underestimated and that and it's complicated isn't it because when you have someone in a human form they're going to do human behavior and all of our human projections are going to go on to them and there is something about that dynamic where they're speaking to the wisest part of you. And I don't know, Karen, if you had the same experience when you met your teacher, but when I met my teacher, the feeling was deep familiarity. Yeah. And like deep relief and some sort of recognition, not like I remembered them, but almost like they spoke to some subtlest part of myself and woke it up. There is a sameness between us, even though there's nothing similar about us. You know, my teacher, like probably yours, old Tibetan man, <laughs> right? Old Tibetan man, 80 something Tibetan man, you know, classically trained, you know, escaped from Tibet, this, the, the Geshe story that we know and love. And nevertheless, it was like it was me all grown up. And I've met a lot of wonderful Geshis and a lot of wonderful Lamas who are of similar type, and they don't all necessarily speak to that same part of me, even if their education is the same, even if their speaking abilities are just as eloquent. You know, it's not just about being a skilled teacher and a good scholar or even an amazing practitioner. It's also the karmic connection, you know, and that karmic connection, once you've found it, is so precious because... Like many of us, I always looked up to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. When I was a baby, baby Buddhist, I loved His Holiness so much and, you know, would watch my little VHS tapes, you know, and um, back in the 90s, right, and loved it so much. And I'd never met him, but I loved these tapes. And I had his books on my bookshelf and I kept them really, really clean and nice, whereas all the rest of my books were all dog-eared and, you know, looking terrible. And there was something in me that knew he is important for my path. But it wasn't until I actually met him in person and met my own teacher in person and had that like dynamic established that my practice took off. Not that it's gone anywhere profound, but it's a lot better than it was. You know, so we do need a human teacher 
but it's a little bit like when you're a child, if you were brought up in a Judeo-Christian situation and your parents introduced you to the concept of God, when you're a little kid, you personify God as like dad <laughs> slash Santa Claus, perhaps when you're little, like dad slash, I don't know how you think of God when you're very, very little, you know, maybe that's how it's described to you, right? And it's someone you can talk to and someone who loves you, you know, if you were brought up in a progressive, friendly Christian church, not like a scary fundamentalist branch or something, but like, you know, God is love. God is a form you can speak to. And then you get older and you get more mature and you realize he's not some white guy on a cloud, dad, Santa Claus, whatever amalgamation. Actually, there's something divine which, you know, if you have Buddhist tendencies, you start to question, is it creator? But, you know, that's another story. But you have some sense of there is something bigger than the human experience that the human experience still is able to touch, right? Whether it's love deeply and most unconditionally, or it's compassion, or it's peace, or it's wisdom, or it's the Dharmakaya mind of all of the Buddhas, <laughs> you know, because you're starting to lean Buddhist, right? But whatever it is, you start to not need the personification, and yet you still relate in a way that is slightly personified because you still want a deep conversation. And then, you know, say you're moving into Buddhism and you, you know, kind of leaving behind the Judeo-Christian roots, but still treating them with a great deal of respect and appreciation. You found your home, your spiritual home. You start to say, all right, well... The guru in the beginning is a little bit like my child's relationship with God, dad slash Santa Claus. Yeah. Or maybe now that you're an adult, dad slash Santa Claus slash spouse that I don't have a sexual relationship with slash best friend slash whatever. It can be all of those things, but then you grow up, right? You grow up and you start relating to them as something that speaks to your deepest wisdom. I think it's interesting that, you know, we have guru Sanskrit, but Lama, Tibetan, Lama in one translation means high mother, mm -hmm. high mother, right? And it's, it's interesting because our only frame of reference for love, compassion, teacherness, learning are our human relationships so far. And the guru Lama, guru Lama Buddha is something deeper and other than that. But we have to kind of start with what needs need to be met, what needs haven't been met, where is our projections, where is our transference, and, and kind of like get to the best version of our human relationship so far, you know, kind of as a pathway to elevate it. You know, and so uh, sometimes there is a some sort of a parental transference, which isn't necessarily a terrible thing in the beginning, as long as it doesn't become all of the expectations around that and all of the kind of like bottomless fit pit of like um, attachment needs or something which I, it's so difficult that like a lot of people in buddhism probably also need just a little bit of good old-fashioned therapy just some good old-fashioned talk therapy like work out some of the stuff and then the dharma is going to land better and but some of us come to the dharma having done a little bit of some sort of self-examination, some sort of seeker, some sort of whatever, you know, maybe a little bit of therapy. And then we just love the Dharma and we forget that we hadn't totally gotten tidy in these other areas. So, you know, there's so many layers to these dynamics and, you know, the years go by, right? And as the years go by more and more, the person that was the catalyst becomes a gateway to the everything and who they are as an individual is still important and still enjoyable, but not necessarily the main thing. And I remember when one of my really deepest teachers passed away, um, His Eminence Chudin Rinpoche, it felt like it, he became everywhere. It didn't make our relationship less. It actually felt like it made our relationship more, you know, having spent time with him in human form for some years first. You know, it was, it was an interesting thing to explore because initially I was really worried. I'm like, oh, wow, he was the heart of so many of my practices, so much of my highest yoga tantra practice I learned from him. What am I going to do? And actually it was fine. And in a way it was better. It was almost like he died and absorbed, <laughs> you know, at least uh, psychologically. Yeah, that's how it feels. And so um, talking to the tiny Chidden Rinpoche at my heart 
works just fine even though now he's been reborn and he's a cute little kid and I'll go meet him someday but um you know it's still there's something of that deepest nature of the relationship is now somehow somewhat integrated in the sense that it's communicatable to myself I identify with a lot of stuff that's been said but there's a couple of things that I that have stuck in my head over the period of the the weeks that we've been doing these studies I love the comment being receptive to what I respect. You know, that's really resonated with me quite deeply. You know, and there's another, there's another um, from the guru from afar, there's that that prayer. Mm -hmm. I used to hear those prayers and I used to thought, think to myself long a while ago, when are they ever going to finish? They just go (laughs) on and on and on and on and very flowery and very, you know, you know, but this one particular. But there's there's um there was one particular that towards the end where it says oh, well it is then please remain on the lotus seat in my heart mm-hmm. I have written that down in my book and I kind of say that you know like without saying the whole lot sometimes but just that particular phrase because that resonates with me quite deeply from coming from a different background you know and um I think I'm still a baby Buddha and I will be that in this lifetime and um, have many lifetimes to kind of wash away the obscurations it's the language that's difficult when you first come into it you know like obscurations it's such a funny word yeah Yeah. Yeah, weird words (laughs) yeah adventitious yeah 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 (laughs) that we kind of have to get used to yeah you know but um they kind of they kind of fit now you know but um yeah just thinking uh, you know that whole awakening that whole it's, it is a process and that whole that guru from afar is like that whole process of you know the lum rim you mm. know that um step by step by step baby steps baby steps yeah so um sometimes I have to give myself a good kick up that you know the rear end and and think you know like this day's nothing's happening you know just uh well maybe tomorrow will be better you know but just holding that guru on the lotus seat in my heart you know and connecting with the outer guru and the inner guru because um that buddha nature my own buddha nature is something something that over a period of time is becoming much more real than it used to be just to be used to be words yeah you know it just used to be words I remember a treat I did up at Mahamudra some years ago and um I thought it was venerable um Jam Young and she said what does it mean what does it mean and she said and she yelled at us all said wake up you know just <laughs> wake up and I thought there was such a great awakening really just yeah wake up stop yeah. sleeping yeah That's great. yeah it was yeah it was pretty cool anyway oh thank you so much thank you yeah. from my heart yes thank you yeah, yeah. totally and yeah. you know we hear these um sometimes the word like by myself alone is interesting yeah and you know these prayers will be referencing different teachings you know and some of the words you know it does take your mind a while to get your head around and context and all these things but the by myself alone one is always fascinating to me because the whole first part of the prayer it's like help me out help me out well actually I'm gonna do it all by myself um (laughs) it's a funny framing right but it's actually straight from the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim. And the joyous effort section is all about what attitudes to adopt to have energy and momentum. So it's like it needs layers of conversation because really what it's saying is if you adopt the attitude by myself alone, you're going to get plenty of help and support because you don't have the pressure and expectations and hopes and fears and anxieties. If you say, please, please save me, I'm all alone, I'm all by myself, I'm only little, please, you have to save me, then all of that pressure and expectations and attachment and all of that glunk means you are unable to be empowered. Yeah, because you feel like the helpless one in the corner. So it doesn't mean by myself alone, but it's the attitude to adopt. 
And it's, it's a very richly empowering psychology. And I think that we already have some experience of that just in our everyday life. Like if you say to your friends, hey, I'm going to go see this beautiful waterfall, um, you know, come with me if you want, they'll come with you. They'll be like, yeah, that sounds great. If you say, I'll go, if you all come with me, maybe they'll come, maybe they won't, right? But if you're like, come what may, I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> by myself alone, I'm going. <laughs> then they're like, oh, you've got good energy with that. Yeah, let's all go. <laughs> I'll bring snacks, you know? So it's interesting to like, think of the psychology of these things too. Yeah, there's always layers and layers. I find myself a little... <sighs> wondering how to make sense with different um, teachers or traditions. Um, when I first came to Buddhism, um, I was just lazy. So I went to what was closest to me. And I think um, I've never heard it described as a more fundamental branch, but I think that would fit the tradition that I encountered. Um, but it was interesting how it led me to this one. Um, so the karma that's very interesting. Um, and so I just find myself, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be like bad fundamentalist or, you know, something like that. But that doesn't feel right either, because I do feel like I've learned something from. And so I found something I wrote about it. I'm like, do gurus teach us boundaries, too? And then what am I? And so I guess I'm just how do I sit with that of watching something that I'm like, eh, I don't know if that's right. And other people, um, you know, because it teaches me to question and then to read more and ask other teachers. And that's a great lesson for me to learn. But then I worry seeing other people saying like, oh, that's absolutely right. And I'm like, is it? And I, I'm not sure how to make peace with that or what to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, your, your intuition sounds really healthy that you're like, that the fundamentalist branch is not for you and you learned a lot in that space. And you're not going to just say, you know, it's a bunch of BS. There was learning there but there's also danger there and your ability to make it a learning is your inner guru woken up other people taking fundamentalist views too literally without deep examination without the inner guru meeting the outer guru is what makes it toxic yeah it's like anything can be toxic if you just take it on face value and say in all circumstances pervasively this is what this should look like yeah. And this, and, you know, cause that's what they said. And you, you know, you get kind of like uh, blinkered, you know, like race, race horses, you know, and you're just looking this way and it becomes kind of a, a, like a spiritual laziness, but a spiritual, like looking down on oneself or just kind of a, a passiveness or a great love of authoritarian structures, because for whatever trauma in your background, you feel safe in authoritarian hierarchies. You know, and so when, you know, when you're talking, I feel your wisdom, you know, you're right on the money. It's like, this is helping me learn boundaries. This is helping me self-reflect, you know, but I also see that same teaching doing weird stuff to some people over here. Yeah. So what is being conveyed and how is it landing is unknown. Are the people that are teaching fundamentalist branch actually enlightened beings triggering a deep conversation that is absolutely necessary for all of us or like the bad behavior of um many lamas in many traditions that's kind of coming to light nowadays you know sexual misconduct and financial abuse and all of these things what if they're all enlightened and they're helping us get organized because dharma has been in the west long enough that now we need to be a little bit more professional and say okay sensitivity training let us be actively anti-racist let us work on our homophobia let us have clear financial structures let us be very conscious of sexual abuse and abuse of authority in general let's get on top of it because now there's enough of us who really love this path and have been doing it a long time we can't just be a bunch of hippies and teepees like having a go we got to get organized you know and you know so whether these are regular people doing regular human foibles or whether these are buddhas manifesting that we have no idea what we know is that ethics hold and so saying a behavior is unethical here's what the dharma says about addressing it is deep practice saying, I can attribute motive because from my ordinary mind, I know everything that's going on in someone else's mind is nonsense. 
right? So to say, oh, it was a Buddha, it was a Buddha, he was definitely teaching us that, that's fundamentalist, saying he is a bad person, he is a bad person, he's just a stupid, bad person who has afflictions. That's fundamentalist, because we don't know which one it is, we have no idea. But the Dharma response on the surface, on the behavior, is the same either way, which is negative behavior can be named, called out, and addressed. The deep inner work then becomes very personal. Do I use patience and compassion and skillful means? Do I go another layer deeper and use lojong, thought transformation, radical reframing? Do I go another layer deeper and remember the emptiness of inherently existent person, action, result? Do I go even deeper and use a tantric view and think all of this is the display of bliss and void? Like all of those layers work and all of those layers can be integrated in one person. But if we are trying to make all of those layers into one glunk, will trigger some sort of cognitive dissonance and do mental gymnastics and make ourselves crazy. So it's like, pick the layer that is resonating for you where you're at, while knowing the other layers exist, and maybe you'll move down and move down into more and more depth and subtlety in the course of time. So, you know, the first level is patience, loving kindness, skillful means. Yeah, like, how do I first not respond with anger? Then how can I bring in, may all sentient beings have happiness? And then how do I use skillful means to create a healthy environment for my community, or at least for myself? You know, so starting there, being there, knowing there are more layers, going to them when you're ready. Sorry, could, I just want to write it down now. So yeah. I'm clearly at the patience, loving kindness, skillful means level. Am I missing one patience, loving kindness, skillful means? Was there something skillful. else? Yep, skillful means, those three. And then just, just for fun, what were the other levels? Right. When you're ready, then Lojong, thought transformation. Yeah. Like eight verses of thought transformation, like 37 practices of a bodhisattva, like wheel of sharp weapons, whatever one you like, something of that genre to really do radical reframing and say, this is fuel for my path. This is a great blessing and teaching. Whether it was intended so or not, doesn't matter. It can be, it will be if I decide. Yeah. <laughs> and then emptiness, <laughs> agent, <Yeah>. action, object, <laughs> then tantra. <laughs> right. uh, maybe in like, uh, how many eons later, I'll ask you about that one. <laughs> A couple months, you'll be fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where we get tangled, I think, with layers of practice, too, is that um, so many of our teachers come from a different cultural background that when they do something that we would never do, it, it's hard to, like, respond right, because we think, but they are so much more advanced in this, 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 and this topic. How could they be worse than me in that one? That doesn't make sense. As if growth is even across all topics, areas across the board. Like growth is not tidy like that. It's not like you learn to read and learn to walk and learn to drive all at the same time. They're developed as different skill sets and they occur at different times. And because of the way we were grow grown up in our culture, we assume certain things are learned at certain times. But of course, in different cultures, different things take priority and emphasis. You know, so we're assuming because we already get it about boundaries, or we already get it about abuse of power and authority, or we already understand about racism and homophobia and sexism and climate change, that they will too because they know all of the four tenet schools and can explain them in elaborate detail. They may or may not, <laughs> right? Or they may be showing the appearance of not because that's in accordance with their ordinary appearance. It's a lot, isn't it? So what are we communicating with? What is it communicating to? The inner guru and the outer guru, we get more and more subtle the more we sit with it. Yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts, guru thoughts or questions? Okay, so we'll do a practice to stabilize the blessings. 
So to stabilize the blessings of the Guru Buddha and stabilize the blessings of this whole retreat and this whole course, we're going to just do a very gentle Gandan Lagama or 100 Deities of Tashita, the 100 of Deities of the Land of Joy. It's a very short practice. It's very sweet and beautiful. And um, if you're new to it, don't worry, I'll walk you through it. So nice meditation posture. Straight back. And just be in the body. Shifting out of the analytical mind for a little bit into the simple concentrated mind that can go step by step, one thing at a time. Right now, just body. few deep intentional breaths, helping your body to settle, helping your nervous system regulate, helping your mind. In through the nose, all the way down into the diaphragm. Out through the nose or mouth, whichever one is comfortable. From the heart of the protector of hundreds of deities of Tashita comes a cloud resembling a mass of fresh white curd. At its crest is omniscient Losong Drapa, king of the Dharma and his spiritual sons. Please come to this abode. And so visualize in the space in front, Maitreya, the Buddha of loving kindness in Tashita heaven. From his heart comes a stream, which then has Lama Tsongkhapa, and then his two disciples, Gelsip J and Kedrip J. And just think that Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples embody every single teacher that has ever moved your heart towards the Dharma. Every single text that has sparked an insight. Every single holy object that has ever uplifted your mind. Think that this particular shape at this particular time represents and embodies and encompasses all of that. Venerable gurus with your white smiles of delight, seated on lion thrones, lotus and moon in the space before me. Please remain for hundreds of eons in order to spread the teachings as the supreme field of merit for my mind of faith. Your intelligent minds comprehend the full extent of objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is the ear ornament of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies blaze with the glory of renown. I prostrate to you who are meaningful to see, hear, and recall. I offer this ocean-like cloud of offerings, actually arranged and mentally created, to you the supreme field of merit, such as pleasing water offerings, various flowers, fragrant incense, light, and scented water. Whatever non-virtuous actions of body, speech, and mind, 
I've accumulated from beginningless time, and in particular this mass of transgressions of my three vows. I confess individually with sincere regret. In this time of degeneration, you studied extensively and strove to practice. By abandoning the eight concerns, your life of freedom and endowment became meaningful. From the depths of my heart, I rejoice, O protector, in the great waves of your deeds. May a, round, may a rain of profound and extensive dharma fall from the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion. Gathered in the sky of your dharma body, venerable holy guru, to care for disciples in any way appropriate. May any virtue that I've accumulated benefit the entire teachings and all reincarnating beings. In particular, may the essence of the teachings of Venerable Losandrapa shed illumination for a long time. And so we think the Guru Buddha in the form of Lama Tsongkhapa is one in nature with Chenrezig, the essence of compassion, one in essence with Manjushri, the essence of wisdom, one in essence with Vajrapani for power and skillful means. We make requests to all of these merged into one. Me may say way to Jen Jen Rezi. Dream a can pay Wampo Jampelyum. Gan Chen Kei Pei Sorgen Song Kappa Lo Zong Dra Pei Shap La Sol Wadden Mig Mei Se Wei Te Chen Chen Rezi Dream a campaign, Wampo jump, young, Gahan Chan Kape, Sorgan Song Kappa, Lozong Drape, Shapla, Solwadam, Mig may say, Way, Te Chan. Chen Rezig, Dream A Kempe, Wampo Jumpel Yang, Gan Chen Kepe, Sorgan Song Kappa, Lozong Drape, Shapla, Solwadin. And so think from the heart of Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples come three streams of nectar that join into one, which curve in an arc and go to the crown of your head. Nectar and light going down and filling you up with all the blessings and realizations of the path stabilizing the understandings and connections that you've made, supporting your path. Stabilize the visualization. And with awareness of that Guru Buddha, 
sending blessings and realizations. If you feel comfortable, you can add the mantra, prayer under your breath. Mi me se we te chen chen reze, dri me kempe wampo jem belyang, du po malo jem se sang we dong, gan jen kepe su gen song kapa, lo zang jop e shap la so wa dev. Repeating that to yourself at your own speed while holding the blessing visualization. And then think, my glorious and precious root guru, take your seat on the lotus and moon on my crown. Please care of me with your great kindness and bestow on me the cities of body, speech, and mind. And Lama Tsongkhapa's disciples dissolve into him. He dissolves into Maitreya, into Shita heaven. And you stay connected to Maitreya, the Buddha of loving kindness. Okay. So you can relax your attention. That practice is a good purification and a good blessing stabilization. And it's also said to really help with lung and anxiety. So if you're feeling um, like chakra constriction, like your heart center hurts or your tummy hurts, like you're having constricted channels worse than usual, um, it can actually help loosen those up and settle you down. So um, that simple visualization. And if you don't know Lama Tsongkhapa and Maitreya or don't have a connection with it, you can also just think general warm golden light coming to you down and through. Yeah. Um, the name of that version, that's just uh, Gandan Lagama or Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga. It's the straight form. So 
in the FPMT, we often do that practice Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga with all of the add-ons from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, which are beautiful and excellent, sometimes including the five wisdoms, sometimes including all sorts of beginning prayers and Lama Rim prayers and ending prayers, but that's just the practice on its own in its raw form. That translation is by Vula Zarpani, who is one of our amazing translators in our organization. I really recommend her if you've ever um, come across any of her translations. They're really precise and really beautiful. So Vula is an amazing translator. So that's where that one comes from. All right. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit, but it's all <laughs> related, which is just to take a minute and think about all of the reflections you've done in this retreat. We did um, reflections on the five main delusions and reflections um, and emphasized practice on purifying body, speech, and mind. So what we want to do now is just kind of sit with, in an ordinary day, now that, you know, my life is sort of less chaotic than it maybe once was when I was, you know, young and crazy or had family stuff or, you know, pre-pandemic, I don't know, all the things like theoretically things are starting to settle a little bit back to normal, whatever normal is. Given that, how are we trending in terms of our afflictions? Like which one is our favorite? And in terms of non-virtues, um, are we more likely to have mental only or mental and verbal, mental and physical, all three, how's it going? So not any kind of guilt, not any kind of shame, no identification, but just kind of taking a minute and thinking through all of the reflections you've been doing and asking yourself, what's the one I really need to start focusing on now in my life? Because it seems to be getting a lot of um, I don't know, trouble. So we'll just do a very brief, um, maybe a 10 minute journal exercise, kind of bringing it all together. So thinking of the 10 non-virtues, the negativities of body, speech, and mind, the list is there. And the five root delusions, anger, ignorance, pride, attachment, and jealousy. Summarize your tendency with each, or at least the most prevalent one. So we'll just spend 10 minutes with that, and then we'll purify it. And starting to wrap up your thought. Okay, winding up. <clears throat> and that will become the raw material for your purification in a few seconds. <laughs> so we won't spend as much time going through body, speech, and mind because you just did. So we're going to kind of take that list and really purify and then spend more time with power of resolve. So... Um, <clears throat> We're going to get into the meditation posture and do our final meditation. Okay. Refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange churon soge churnam lai jan chu padu dani kapsuchi dagi jin soge pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa sho sange churon soge churnam lai jan chu padu dani kapsuchi dagi jin soge pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa Pasho Sange Churon Soge Chunamla John Chupadu Dani Kapsuchi Dagi Jin Soge Pesonam Ki Rola Pinche Sange Drupasho So spend a moment with refuge. and spend a moment with the visualization. Vajrasattva, radiant white, made of transparent light above the crown of your head, facing the same direction as you.
And then generating the power of regret, all of those actions that you've just been thinking about, the killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, the lying, divisive speech, harsh speech and idle gossip, the covetousness, ill will, wrong views, just generate strong regret. Thinking those I remember and those I'm emphasizing, may they all be purified, as well as anything I haven't remembered or haven't emphasized. And so then we imagine that from Vajrasattva's heart center, a stream of white light down through the crown of our head, down and through flushing us clean a simple visualization of light, like an inner shower and all negativities being dispelled through the lower doors, dissolving into space, never to be seen again. Stabilizing that. And add the short mantra. Om Vajrasattva Hum. 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 And then generating the power of resolve, time-specific promise to oneself and the Guru Buddha Vajrasattva about what one will refrain from in the future and for how long specifically. Think in terms of something physically, verbally, and mentally and how you're going to work on it. Practical plans. You can also be thinking about those five delusions. Just be very clear and specific and practical.
If it helps you to write down these promises, these resolutions, go ahead and write them down. Or just repeat them, stabilizing them. And wrapping up that power of resolution. Bodhisattva dissolves into light and absorbs into you. And add rejoicing for yourself, people in your life, strangers doing positive work, all sentient beings, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Gurus. Spending a minute with that. And we dedicate all of the merit of this session, all of the merit of this course, all of the merit in general. Shanchu semcho rimpo she ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yampa me pai gone gondu pawa show toni dawa rimpo she. Ma ke panam ke gyuchi, ke pan yampa me pahi, gone gondu pelwan shom. May we actualize bodhicitta. May we realize emptiness. May we develop the merit 
mental momentum, good karma we need to progress. We may purify, may we cut ignorance, may we realize emptiness, may purification stabilize and complete. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so any uh, hanging questions before we call it a day? Nope, enough to be getting on with? Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you all so much for all of your practice. It's really, um, it's really obvious that you've been practicing really sincerely, and I appreciate that so much. And big thanks to Vajapani and all of the staff and volunteers who have um, hosted this and um, have hosted me while I developed this course. So I wouldn't have been able to develop this course, um, Power of Mantra, all of the classes, all of the retreats, if it hadn't been for the support of Vajrayana Institute. So um, if all of you could support Vajrayana Institute to facilitate more um, classes of this type with lots of other teachers, that would be wonderful for the greater good um and uh, thanks everyone and and thank you venerable um i was just going to comment on that how beautiful it was for you to come here be here and to take you know a a, a brand new book and make this amazing amazing course to kind of go through it and go you know, based into every aspect of the dharma bringing it into these practices so thank you please and please 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 come again uh and continue to teach uh, Vajrapani and everyone here online and all the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.